Yeah, it's afternoon time here. So we're, we've just kicked off. We're getting recorded here. Firstly, I just want to thank you. Thanks to everybody for coming along today. I want to say a huge thanks to Tam for joining us. Um, a little unusual time. Normally, it's a Friday morning. Switched it up to a, to a Wednesday this week. But really appreciate Tam joining us. We also appreciate Tam getting a haircut for joining us today. So mm -hmm. really, you know, looking forward to his presentation. Um, Tam, how are you this afternoon? Everyone well? Yeah, I'm very good. And you've obviously, you know, slagged me about my haircut before we came online there. And I was just explaining that after we got beat against Hearts, I decided to, to think about how I can settle the players down on the, the Tuesday morning when we came back. So I went to the Turkish barber on the on the Monday and I think he just about, you know, butchered me enough that gave the boys a bit of a chuckle. So I think it was kind of mission accomplished. And see, the funny thing, Tom, when I was doing some research yesterday, I looked at a couple of pictures of you and, and I noticed on both sides, just above your ears, there was a wee bit of grey sitting in, mm -hmm. you know, and and I feel as if the grey's been removed now. You know, maybe that was part of the part of the, the plan there. <laughs> the the fact that you actually focus on the grey hair for me is an absolute pleasure because <laughs> look look at the monobrow on my eyebrows, <laughs> an absolute slug just above my oh, eyes. This this is brilliant. So obviously we're going to we're going to kick off with this picture here that you can see, Tam. I know you've probably seen this once or twice. Um. Give us a quick description of where and when and how the hell that was. McDermott Park in a League Cup game. I think we actually got beat 1-0. Um, I was a captain East Fife at the time, and I'm probably uh, I'm probably looking a bit dazed and confused and thinking, how the hell did I get here? Um, right. But, yeah, many moons ago now and a couple of chins ago as well, but the looks of it. Oh, great, great, brilliant. So what we're going to do, we're going to jump straight into this. Johnny's going to pull up the... In fact, I think you're going to pull up the slides yourself, Tam. Um, we, you know, obviously got a presentation to run through for everybody just to give you an insight to, to part of Tam's journey. Um, so if you just want to pull that up, if you can if you can pull that on your screen, Tam, would be great. Yeah, no problem. I'm just waiting on getting made. Give me a second. Let me click on share screen. See why we're waiting. See why we're waiting, Tom. Johnny, oh, yeah. you get that picture. You get that picture, Johnny. I just wanted to do you a wee favour here, Tom, just before we get kicked off. Is uh, you obviously know my relationship with your your sporting director. I was his best man back in the day, way back in the day. And, and I thought I would throw you a wee, a wee asset for your next contract talks today, Tam. So here's yeah. wee one for, to tuck away in your back pocket. Tam, this is a wee favour for me to you, and this is non-scripted. Um, so that guy, so that guy, and apologies to Andy that's had your breakfast this morning. Um, <laughs> but that guy on the left is, is Tam's boss, and that guy on the right is, is me. And that's actually 31 years ago, and I don't know what the hell happened. Um, but we can move on for that now, Johnny. But I just wanted to give you that as a favour, Tam, as you sit down and have your, your next contractual talks. That was actually in Tenerife in 1990. And uh, there's a few pictures attached to that story. But we'll move on very, very quickly, Tam. He's, he's fallen quite far since then, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and I know anyway. he, he's, he's listening in the background. And, and it's interesting because when when I first got this job, Eric, you know, there, there was a multitude of different things kind of said about me online, and I'm going to share a couple of them. Um, right. But, you know, I, I was alleged to have been Tony's yes man, and look, this is a guy that would just sit in his box and say nothing, you know. Yeah. And, and I actually made a joke with Tony because I was actually like hours away from being announced as a Dundee United head coach, and we actually still hadn't agreed personal terms. And I actually told Tony... Um, listen, your career will be over if you don't secure me as a head coach because I'm just a junior manager with no pedigree and you don't even actually have me secured yet. So oh, I, I took him right over the barrel. Um, so I, I think he's probably waiting to get beat a couple of games before he gets rid of me, but see if, only you, see if only you'd had that picture at that time, Tim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'll finish those I'll tell you what I do have. offline. Yeah, somebody's just put something in the chat he said true yeah so again the, the the first slide here would actually again you know point towards you know a, a polished appointment we've just beaten rangers here everything's kind of seamless upward trajectory um and but the reality is that's obviously not not the way it all transpired i think 
when um, when I got appointed into this job, to say that it caused a bit of a storm would be actually kind of putting it, it mildly. But in, in a weird way, I kind of used it as almost kind of validation that, you know, I had the minerals to, to take on a job like this. I was well aware that I'd come from nowhere, but you started to, to feel the intensity online. I mean, the, the first tweet is, is someone kind of promising to kind of run us out of town within a week, myself and Adam. You know, the, the next one is, is kind of talking around the fact that probably I don't have the gravitas or the experience to, to actually manage the players or attract players. And then the next one follows a kind of similar vein of form. But then as the, as the season's progressed, we've obviously started to, to get some performances, develop a style. We've made some decent signings through the work that Tony, Sean and the, the, the staff do. I think we've managed to get a better um, performance level from a lot of the players that were already in the building. And slowly but surely, you know, the, the opinion of me has started to, to change to the point that people are prepared to get tattoos on their legs of, of my name within a, a, a short period of time. And I know there's a lot of Scottish people on here. So within the, the Dundee United fan base, they say I'm the plus shut and champion in 2021. So I've got to take that as a, a backhanded compliment, I think, Eric. Of course, I can tell you what, what a great picture. And, and I was actually over there at the time of your appointment and, and I was in it pre-season the first couple of days. And, and you know, in, in all seriousness, I, I, I remember the noise. And, and But I remember having many conversations with Tony and... and his conviction of you know the strategy and 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 where the club wanted to go and 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 what the next steps would look like and sure enough you know here we sit here and and I can say this in all sincerity we've been doing these conversations for you know 16 months now and we've had Scotland managers we've had some big names but but this is the first time that we've sat down with a head coach who's in the top four of the Scottish Premier League you know and and kudos to you Tam for for you know, your resilience and, 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 you know, how you've gotten to where you've gotten today by, by sticking to your, you know, your principles and, and looking. And I look at, you know, I, I watch most of the games and, and I look at even your playing style and Big Brian Welsh is here with us today and we'll have him speaking just a little bit as well, who's, a, you know, obviously at the Indian United Hall of Famer and he'll talk about the old days, not a little bit, but maybe the new days. But kudos to you for coming through the noise and, and to where you are today. I'm sure there's a sense of excitement from, from yourself, Tam. Well, there is, and I, I was always aware, and, and I'll touch on this on the next slide, but the, the, the key reason that I'm actually here today, other than to obviously show that I can actually have a laugh at my own expenses, I think I'm I'm talking to probably a lot of like-minded coaches and, and you know, a, aspiring football managers on, on this call in the sense that the majority of Scottish coaches who I think leave these shores typically do so because there's not an abundance of opportunity within Scottish football. And it's it's always very difficult to actually get opportunity and thrive within that opportunity because there, there's a lot of harsh judgments passed on people that have different backgrounds that look at things differently. And I, I obviously had the uh, the comparison to Ian Cathro when, when I was first appointed. And what, one of the key things for me during, during those comparisons was to actually acknowledge that Ian Cathro is a top, top operator. He's he's probably a very wealthy guy. He's, he's operated at the top level of the game, worked with you know, the elite level players. So let, let's actually recognise and celebrate someone like Ian Cathro. And yeah. I, I think there'll be a lot of people on this call today who have had to go to America, Canada, North America, pretty much to develop their career because either their own country maybe doesn't necessarily want them, doesn't have the right opportunity for them. And that, that, that was something that I felt at regular intervals, even when I was doing well at Kelty. But I've always taken a, a, a view, when I got the Kelty job at, at 32 years old, I'd probably been a bit of a frustrated football manager since maybe my, my early to mid-20s, captaining teams, always thinking about football, being someone that the manager can come to and speak about, you know, the dressing room, the team, where we're going, how do we get better? And I've always had this weird analogy, and, and I've kind of presented on it before, in that I see football uh, management a lot like snakes and ladders, in the sense that you could appear to be doing well at one point, so at this moment in time, we're appearing to be doing okay. But football changes so quickly, 
And the key thing for me is to make sure that, that, that I'm always focusing on the things that are actually really, really important to me um, and what I think have actually kind of put me in this position in the first place. So throughout my whole career, which I'll kind of touch on um, on the next slide, I think one of the consistent things I've always tried to do, because I've not always been in the football industry, is acquire skills, different types of skills, skills that actually allow me to go from the boardroom, talk strategy, talk vision, talk asset management. You know, if, if I'm dealing with, with Tony in a conversation on contract extensions and I'm talking about, you know, utilisation of players, return on investment, how we actually create marketability for, for our players and supply chains. And then equally for the players, you talked about a couple of our players earlier, Ian Harks, et cetera, actually having the, the, the self-awareness and the, the leadership skills to, to be able to not only try and improve him, as a, as a kind of mid-20s, high aspirational player, or young players, or senior players, but also to eventually get a, a, a job like the Dundee United head coach role, you obviously have to have highlights that there has to be, like at Kelly, where we had title wins, we obviously developed a club, they're now a league club. I've I, I seen that potential from probably... 18 months to two years into the job. That, that was something that we intentionally wanted to do. And like, like I'm doing on this call just now, the, the key thing for me is actually building networks, spending time with, with like-minded people. Because what, what I found fascinating since I've come into this job, Eric, is that the same people that would send me a text at half past two when I'm playing against Eyemouth or Tweedmouth in East of Scotland, they'll actually still send me a text when I'm actually sitting on my own at Celtic Park when the coaches are out warming the players up and they'll just drop me a text and say, I actually really fancy you today. I, th I think, and I'm thinking, man, we, we're only like, we're only at the very, very early stages of our journey at Dundee United. I'm getting battered online, but this small group of people that are really invested in, and by the way, the, the coach at amateur level, you know, underage football, uh, junior football, just people I've spent a lot of time with over the years to sense check my ideas. To, to challenge me, and, and I do vice versa. But these are the guys that actually really kind of motivate me because I'm still the same guy. It's just football at the end of the day. And I take a lot of strength from, from their support. And the, the, and the I think, thing I I think not, to, not to stop your straight here in Tampa, but, you know, I, I think of the first slide that you started with here and the noise when you came on board. And I think of literally two months later, as you walk off the field, as you're thanking the fans, you know, for, for that, um, their support against Celtic, for example. Let's just look at that that key month that you had, that the springboard mm -hmm. month, you know, where you've beaten Rangers, you've drawn with Celtic, you, you've won the Dundee Derby, you know, and all of a sudden it, it springboarded you, you know, forward for, for a potentially fantastic season and a great start to your management career. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, six weeks prior, you're getting nothing but shite online. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there's a massive sense of, you know, resilience and pride and, you know, but also your inner circle, you know, is I, I think I'm sure those times your inner circle was brilliant for you. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I think the thing I, I, I realized through that, that whole kind of episode, if you like, is that you're either going to, you know, sink or swim here. And yeah. I always kept going back to the fact that, and, and again, if I can use the snakes and ladders analogy, to go from Celtic Hearts to Dundee United's academy to the first team head coach at Dundee United in the Scottish Premiership, that, that's kind of three or four significant jumps on the snakes and ladders board. So I think from a context perspective, I probably realised that if and when I get that type of job, People aren't going to celebrate it. They're not really going to recognise it. They're, they're going to point towards previous risks that haven't actually worked out. So I, I had to embrace that. I had to also appear to be in control for the players. I had to appear to be in control for, you know, the staff. And yeah, there was there was some initial interviews that I did that, you know, it's, it's almost like rabbit in the headlight stuff because yeah. the, the level of attention was yeah. so intense. But you've got to be kind to yourself as well. You've got to understand that you're going to say the wrong thing at, at times. You're going to make mistakes, but see as long as your detail is consistently good with the players on the training pitch, how you deal with them, they, that, that, that's where they take their strength. And everything else is just noise for players. And because I was part of the club last year, Eric, I kind of knew 
the level of service that they got. I'm not being critical of anything that went before. It was yeah. just different to the service that we wanted to provide. So yeah. I knew that we could really capitalise with these players and really respect them as people, as players, give them content on the pitch that can give them clarity. And the thing I've realised about working with players at this level is that they do actually have a need for really strong, clear rules, principles, detail, and just make sure that you give them scenarios that they can actually plan and prepare and condition themselves for the game because players at this level really like to feel prepared. And that's something that we really pride ourselves on as a staff. And I think one of the brilliant things for me as well, Tam, is is it, it took a lot of cojones to, to to even to this day and, and a lot of backbone to, to to implement your style of play. You know, as as I look at your style of play now and as and, and again, no disrespect to what came before or previous years, but it's it's much more free flowing and and it looks to me from the outside looking in is the players enjoy, you know, playing for the group and, and even talking to Tony recently just about the you know, the, the numbers that they're putting up, you know, on their data. And and but the style of play and, and it's far more easy on the eye. And you can see that even with the fan feedback. That took some kahunis, you know, your first job, Premier League, big expectations, the noise, and all of a all of a sudden you want to, you know, dictate a, you know, implement a, an offensive style of play as well. I think was what what was quite unique about my appointment is obviously I came from the academy. So as someone who was actually paid to implement the style of play within the academy, I almost had to want to create something at the first team level that would allow a seamless yeah. transition from the academy players to the first team players. So that, that would probably point towards the notion that the young players were at the forefront of my mind, which they were. But I also targeted myself for making the, the senior players better. So I wanted to really engage with them just on a, on a, on a personal level. I wanted to, to give them confidence that I'm not going to be a manager that's talking about, you know, in two or three transfer windows, we can be judged. I want us to, to be judged as a collective straight away because I think there's capacity for our senior players to improve. And I think what that's done, Eric, is it's actually made it more difficult for the, senior, for the younger players to get opportunities and I'm okay with that because yep. if if they didn't take the olive branch that I gave them, the senior players, and they didn't perform to the levels that were expected, then I would have been ballsy enough to go straight to the young players. But I'm delighted to say that most of the senior players, and they, they need to take all the credit for it, yep. they've, they've all had a different level. So the yep. younger yep. players now have got a bigger task on their hands to get into the team but it's also allowed us to accelerate our playing style in the short term as well. And I think let me touch on just two players, and, and you've got so many success stories, but let me touch on two players that I think, you know, that have been a massive success story for you this year, you know, thus far is, number one, Charlie Milgrew. You know, you look at Charlie, you look at his age, you look at his journey, he's gone down to England, captain to Blackburn, but at the end of last year, you know, he'd gone out and, he'd gone out and lonely Fleetwood Town, and it kind of looked as if he was you know, just winding down a little bit. And and now here we are, you know, November going into December, probably one of the, you know, people were calling for him to be back in the Scotland squad, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think um, I was in it your first couple of days of pre-season up at St Andrews and, and you look at a player like that and the, the influence that he has, you know, not only on your younger players, but on the culture and on your environment. Do you want to speak to that and how that's, that's gone for you, Tam? Yeah, and... and the interesting thing about actually having Charlie's pedigree and experience around from a positive perspective is that you can obviously lean on a lot of rich experience. You, you, you could ask him questions about, you know, situations in his career, how do we advance a team, how do we improve defensively? And I'm not saying that we're having a, a, a forum, you know, yeah. with, with Charlie yeah. on a regular basis, but there, there's ways and means to get access to that information and what he also does is he, he, he keeps the, the, the staff on us because we, we know the, the caliber of staff that he's had exposure to, you know, the types of environments. So yep. you, you almost indirectly want to impress that, that type of player because we pride ourselves on our quality of work, but he's also our player. We need to make demands of him. We need to, we need to give him confidence that, that he can still play for Scotland. And to play for Scotland 
He's going to have to be part of a really strong defensive unit at Dundee United. We're going to have yeah. to keep clean sheets. He's going to help us, you know, develop the playing style. But I think where Charlie's value comes is on the training pitch each day, like you said, because the way that that guy trains, every single moment of every single session, his recovery, his diet, his commitment to his football in terms of requests and clips and, and thinking about football ideas, it's no surprise to me that this is a guy that's actually cultivated a top-level career through all his own endeavours, and it's 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 a pleasure to be around it each day, to be fair. And I thought it was actually a loss to you in the last game when he went off at halftime. You know, just with his composure, his leadership, his, you know, his style of play, even the fact that he's naturally left-sided and Edwards went across to the left, I think he was a loss for you. Second second player I wanted to touch on was, was Ian Harts, that many of us here, you know, on this side of the Atlantic are very, very familiar with. And I, I personally remember Ian as a 14-year-old um, at Gonzaga High School in D.C., you know, mm-hmm. obviously came behind, you know, his dad had a big reputation as, as a very successful U.S. men's national team captain. Went through the journey with D.C. United. He actually won the college player of the year here um, at Wake Forest. Um, maybe, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm going to be careful of how I define it. Maybe he lost his way a little bit here in MLS mm-hmm. and, and, you know, ended up over in Scotland. His, his grandparents were both from Scotland, um, had the, you know, the, the work permit and all that stuff. I actually talked to Tony about him ended up at Dundee United. But I look at his journey and, and you know, since he's landed over there and, and he's just won the Premier League Player of the Month. And mm-hmm. and I look at that and 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 I'm like, you know, he's he, he, the light's gone on. And and mm-hmm. and you know for whatever reason he, he's found the best form of his career probably. It's it's, it's funny because at, at 26 years old, I would imagine most guys on the call have kind of played at some point and you tend to find that when you get into your mid 20s the the fluctuation between good, bad, and indifferent performances start to dissipate a little bit. You know, you can get a little bit more consistency in your game. You, you feel a bit more comfortable. But I'd like to think that what, what we brought to Ian is, again, quality conversation. Ian's a high-quality individual. He, he's a thinker on the game. He likes to be spoken to, you know, properly. He, he's, a, he's a true teammate. He's got total respect in, in, in our dress room and, and I think what we've tried to do a little bit is actually just liberate him a little bit he's got phenomenal running power he's got high levels of athleticism as, as you guys will know but he's a he's a top top footballer and I think the the, the formation and the style of play that that we've landed on and started to implement it just allows him to bring all the kind of best elements out in his game and it's no surprise to me that he's getting a lot of plaudits just now because he's performing to a really top level on a consistent basis Brilliant. Let's jump on to your next slide, Tam. I could, I could, I could digress all day here. I think um, just, just to kind of finish off on this slide, because I think it's, yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's important to kind of mention this for, for anybody that's had and got a similar journey to me. I've, I've mentioned about developing opportunities. And even whilst I was at Kelty, I was actually able to, to develop opportunities with Nat Breda and Holland, with West Ham, Sheffield United. But just as importantly, I was actually able to reject opportunities because I didn't feel like they were that they were right for me. And I think that that is really important in our, in our coaching careers because sometimes it, it's, it's too easy to chase the next opportunity, to want to jump to something else. But I've always kind of taken this kind of strategic approach to evaluating opportunities. And just the final thing is, you know, I've just never been deterred. I, People see me in this country as being slightly different, maybe having an opinion on certain things, but I'm happy to listen to an under-12s coach opinion, an amateur. I, I love talking football with, with, with different people, and I'm never going to be deterred from giving my opinion or wanting to develop, and that, that's probably a strong piece of advice I'd give anyone on this call that's kind of had a similar experience. Absolutely brilliant. What I'm going to say as well, Tam, is, is while we're going down this road with everybody, please feel free, as we always do, is, you know, we're, we're going to up for, open up for Q&A at the end. Um, but in the interim, if you've got any questions, you know, just fire them in the chat box and, and we'll jump into those as well. But we're certainly going to leave some time at the end for everybody to, you know, fire some questions out to Tam as well. Yep, no problem. And and again, just, just before I, I kind of talk about my my career to this point, the, the thing I've kind of reflected on and, and evaluated is that, that timing is everything. 
Um, and for, for a lot of the guys on the call that have taken real opportunity to, to leave, you know, that their homeland, go and coach elsewhere, embrace a new way of life, I always place a lot of emphasis on making sure, you know, an opportunity is real. Is the timing right for family, where you are in your career? And I think the most important thing for me is, is compatibility. So e even when we are signing players, I'm constantly, and a lot of this comes from my, my experience in recruitment of 15 years, I'm always looking for compatibility. So that, that compatibility, I would probably apply to my relationship with Tony, my relationship with the football club in terms of values and principles. And are we aligned? Because if after three or four defeats, if I'm going to feel a pressure externally, I'll, I'll be happy to, to receive it internally as well, as long as there's an alignment and we're actually all striving for the same things. I'm 39, well, I was 39 years old when I, when I got the job. I'm 40 years old now. And I kind of reflect on my career and what's kind of taken me to this point. And when I, when I left full-time football at 21 years old, I, I got involved in the recruitment business. And that, that, that for me was probably a gateway to start to really understanding teams, high-performing teams, chemistry, placing people into cultures, making sure that, you know, we're not putting square pegs in round holes. I started to get really comfortable, you know, meeting people, interviewing people, understanding their personality preferences, their goals, their aspirations. Also within an interview uh, situation, what, what are they not telling me? Because that, that's exactly the same when you, when you sign a player. You know, everyone's got this facade up, you know, they're negotiating their contract, they're, they're trying to portray the best part of themselves. Whereas the best way to build trust with people is to actually show vulnerability. So I think recruitment gave me a lot of really good solid skills that I've been able to take into, you know, different industries, different environments, and allowed me when I when I reflect on the, the first party success we got at Kelly Eric, where we made 11 signings on free transfers and we actually won our first league title together. And I, I, I place a lot of importance on, again, creating an experience for, for, for people when they sign, making sure that the person is first, that they also understand what they're joining, what their expectations are going to be, and how we can actually have success together. And that's been a real consistent theme throughout you know, my career today. And it's still a, a really big skill set that I place a lot of importance on. That's brilliant. Probably brilliant. The, 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 the next part after the, the global recruitment experience, if I can just kind of go back, is yeah. when I joined a company called Insights. I, I, I don't, are you aware of the company Insights? I know Insights. I just did the test last Friday. I'm a yellow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know it well. Yeah. So that, that, that for me was, again, but when, when I look at the assembly of high-performance teams, uh, strengths, weaknesses, how, how opposites attract, and I, I don't talk about this stuff a lot because it can seem a little bit kind of sciencey, a little bit kind of mumbo-jumbo, but when you actually have an understanding from the profile of yourself, other people, team chemistry, and I, I link that back to the example you just gave me recently about Ian Harks. So Ian Harks is somebody who I'd like to think even without doing a profile, I know what his drivers are. I know what yeah. his motivators are. I know what will actually accelerate him in a, in, a, in a performance environment long before we get onto the training pitch. So the conversations that we have, the type of content that I produce for him, everything is so carefully considered based on how I know about my own leadership style, how I know I come across, and how I can connect and adapt to, to other people. And the thing, Tam, as you touched on, just as you touched on, the insights profile for me is fascinating. You know, I, 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 I did it and have done it at a corporate level, and, and I've done it many times. And, and, but it's not necessarily just about self-reflection. It's about, you know, how you best, um, how you best perform with your teammates and within a team environment. You know, and, and, and the really cool part, you know, I did, it, I did it last Friday. I've done it a number of times before. Um, it's with our U.S.-based, you know, company, I believe Insights are based in, I know they're a Scottish company. Dundee. Um, yeah, Dundee. And, 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 you know, it's fascinating that they're the, they're the trailblazers over here as well, mm -hmm. you know, and they're a Dundee-based company. 
it, it really is phenomenal. And see, see, actually working there for a couple of years, Eric, it was almost like a, it, it was a journey of discovery because you how how you communicate with people, even in terms of your your your, your email style. So. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I know in a dressing room that there's someone, so I'm, I'm highly extroverted. So yeah. people on this call probably detect that when I'm passionate about something, I speak really fast and I'm happy to talk fast today. But if I was speaking in a one-on-one -on -one coaching situation or a debrief session with a player who's got high levels of introversion, I would slow down. I would make sure that they had an agenda beforehand. There'd be no surprises, you know, that every conversation wherever possible, you're trying to tailor to the preferences of the, of the individual because if players value detail and clarity, I have an obligation as a, as, as a head coach and a, and a mentor to these players and the provider of clarity that I've got to shape the content so that the, the most amount of information will go in at the earliest possible opportunity. Does that make sense? Totally. Totally. Yeah, it definitely does. And... I, I think the time that I spent at Kelty for, for those five years was an opportunity for me to, to explore, to play around with a lot of things. I'd been player captain at Kelty for a number of years. I was well respected. The club hadn't won a competitive game for 20 games by the time I took over. And then fast forward, you know, one full season and we've actually won the Super League that we almost got relegated out of the year before. And I was... I was toying with so many different, um, you know, leadership ideas, cultural ideas, things that I was just exploring and running with. And I was just starting to almost kind of create my own little kind of package of work. And I, I made a crazy decision because I was in a, a well-paid job at Insights at the time. And I, I, I gave it up on, on a whim to become the, the full-time manager of Kelly Hearts on like 100 quid a week. And I just think to myself, what the hell was I doing? I mean, I've got four kids, mortgage, everything. And the, the diagnostic that, that I'm quite happy to show a couple of kind of tabs on today, I actually took that out to, to the football industry. So I started to approach um, board members who were looking to provide more sustainability within the football clubs because what we know about football clubs is that everything's so reactive. New manager comes in, you can only judge me after I've had three transfer windows, right? Overhaul of players, you know, contracts obliterated. Whereas I've, I've developed this model that actually allows me to control what I think is to control performance, narrative, manage expectations, go on to board meeting calls and be able to talk about how the team's performing, you know, what the contingency plans are, how we're developing young players, and that, that, that for me was a real way of developing my network whilst I was actually trying to climb, you know, the, the snakes and ladders board. And it probably came as a bit of a shock to people when I, when I joined the, the academy at Dundee United yeah. because I'd always worked with adults. I'd always, you know, been the Kelty manager, but I also had a lot of skills gaps and the skills gaps were centred around working with, with young players so if I was hoping to get into a full-time environment, I really wanted to close over that skills gap of proving that I'd worked with young players. And the interesting thing for me is that when I made the commitment to join the academy through Andy Goldie's leadership, and there's so many experts within the United Academy, I, I was a novice yeah. in comparison. But the thing that I, I committed to doing was keeping my nose out of first-team business, staying away from you know the, the, the training ground, and really earning my stripes with my with my academy colleagues. I mean, I had a, a key to almost every you know room in, in Tanadice. I was washing strips. I was picking and dropping young players off. I was coached under 18s. I was coached under 12s. I was holding Zoom calls with you know parents. I was doing the full shooting match, and then timing, opportunity, compatibility through through COVID. I obviously got an opportunity last October to actually lead the first team for 10 days. You probably remember that, Eric. I do remember it. Yep, yep. I remember so it well. That that was that was good and bad for me, that, that situation, because everything I was suppressing to work with the academy, and I was suppressing it well, I was, I was really committed to that. To get that 10 days of actually coaching first team players, working with adults again, 
back in a performance environment, albeit for a limited period of time, it was almost like the kind of the claws had kind of unsheathed again, and I was I, I was reminded about what it is I was looking to do. And because I've got a great relationship with the club, the club were actually quite happy to help me look for opportunities external to the club. They were they were more than happy to do that. But then the way that things transpired with the previous manager leaving, the opportunity arose, the timing was right, they felt I was compatible with, with what they were looking for, and then I got the opportunity. And that's me four or five months into the job. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think to, you know, to, to, to pause at this point, I, I did mention we've got, we've got Brian Welsh here. Brian, I, I don't know if you can turn on your video there, mate. I know you're on the golf course, no doubt, sitting in your cap. But, you know, it's, it's a nice little change of direction here. Brian's obviously a Dundee United Hall of Fame player. Played there 11 years. In the old days, under, you know, the legendary Jim McLean. But he's obviously still a big fan of the club. Watches the games this year. Brian, thanks for joining us. Great seeing you, mate. And uh, did you you just laid your driver down on the ground right now, didn't you? No, I'm sitting inside Walmart, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> it's hey, a, I'm like... Uh, you, mate. And, and I just wanted to see, you know, you could, you could speak a little bit to your journey, Brian, and, and to, you know, to hear where, you know, where Tam is today and where, you know, where the club is today. I'm sure you can, you know, reflect back to the good old days, but also reflect to where it's going just now as well, Brian. Uh, well, first off, I've, I've loved listening to Tam. Um, but, you know, I think there, there was a little bit of surprise, um, but he sounds to me he's the right man for the job, you know. Yeah. Modern manager, um, and the way that he's building relationships with with players is so important. So there's been a lot of good information that he that he's gave everybody on the call, you know. And I'm impressed the way the way he spoke. Um, and, and I think the thing, see this before we came on, Brian, and and to yep. you know, Sam and I were talking just before we came on the Zoom, and he talked about the recent. You know the statue going up at Jim McLean and 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 embracing that and the culture of the old days and what that represented. I'm sure you know you you look back with a lot of pride of your journey there, but also a lot of pride of where it sits today. It's, you know, sitting fourth in the Premier League. Yeah, definitely. And I think the academy has always played a massive part. If that if our academy's successful, Dundee United's successful. You know, yeah. it was always the, the little we Jim had the corner shop mentality. You know, yeah. um, and he knew he had to to grow the youth and get some of these players through. Um, and they were so closely linked together. You know, we used to go to to training, um, like that would be S form training. I'd be 13, 14 year old in the the minibus would pick us up and we Jim would be on the minibus, Watty Smith, Gordon Wallace, Kenny Cameron, you know, top, top coaches. That's that's how invested they were in youth, you know. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting, I'm, I'm listening to Tam and the, the relationships and how I think of we Jim um, when I was obviously coming through. We, we Jim was a genius. You know, a yeah. coaching genius. He had this knack. He could come in a changing room after the game and tell you exactly what you'd done wrong, you know, <laughs> exactly yeah. what you'd done right. And you were just waiting on it, you know. But he's, uh, in terms of, like, what Tam spoke about, relationships and stuff like that, very, very difficult, you know. He was yeah. a hard man. Yeah. He was a hard man to deal with. And to be brutally honest, most of the players couldn't stand up. I couldn't stand them, you know, but yeah. it was yeah. a great place to to go and learn just that knowledge and stuff like that, you know. And it, it's great to hear that that Sam is taking the other side with the relationships and and stuff like that, taking on board. They spoke about Ian Harks and you know to get into a, a, like Ivan Golak always got the best out of me because he knew yeah. how it worked, you know. Um, yeah. Kicking my ass every day wasn't for me, you know. And there is players that need a kick up the ass, you know. So I think, I think as well now when in the modern game, I mean the days of like balling and shouting and the changing room and stuff like that, they're over, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's very difficult now to to survive doing that kind of thing, you know. Yeah, but I think also Tom, just to bring you into this piece, Tom, as well is, I think a big part of your role is is how do you impress the old 
but but implement the new. You know, as as you embrace what that was, the Jim McLean culture, the the Richard Goffs, the Eamon Bannons, the you know that whole era and the games against Barcelona. But but implement, you know, develop a new club, develop it, you know. And and it's interesting hearing Brian talking about Jim McLean's influence and his persona to to compare to you know what you're driving here today. There's just such a different animal, Tam. Mm-hmm. I think um, the, the first thing that I would probably add to that is, you know, player, players are super professional these days. And generally speaking, the way that they actually train every day, they, and I think the landscape has changed because of the, the, the earning capabilities for players as well. The the, the career has always been short. They, they've got this opportunity to, to earn and to do well. And I, I'd like to think that the players have actually earned, you know, me being a relationship manager because... I'm more than happy to to be someone who makes demands, holds them to account, isn't a relationship type, you know, head coach. But what I've seen from the players, even right back to when I was first appointed, I met every single player uh, one-to-one. And I think when, when you actually spend an hour with each player and you just actually hear how much knowledge they've got, how much experience they've got, how much the commitment they've actually got to making the club better, that actually almost allowed me to decide that I'm actually going to harness relationship with these guys because they, they're playing at a level that, that I never did. I, I don't need to be embarrassed about that. They, they, they've got aspirations to hit a, a, another level or drive the club forward. It was quite clear for me what each player wanted to help the club achieve and also for them to achieve individually. And the great thing for me is that once an Ian Harks in that one-to-one conversation tells me about what his ambitions are, he's almost signing a bit of an emotional contract with me where I'm obligated to, to drive you now, Ian, because you've told me where you want to get to, what success would look like for you. Therefore, I need to see that on the training pitch every single day, every single conversation, every single performance, wherever possible. So the investment of actually speaking to each player in the close season one-to-one was almost where I cornered them into them telling me what they wanted to achieve for themselves that year. So I might appear that I'm being a relationship guy, but I'm constantly reinforcing what they've told me where they want to get to. So that comes out in sessions. It comes out in the demands that are placed on them as well. And just to finish your piece here, Brian, is... I'm sure, you know, three, four months ago, you know, you, you're a Dundee United fan, you're a Hall of Fame player, you, you know, you, you, you came through a, a phenomenal generation, you know, the Billy McKinleys, the Duncan Fergusons, the Christian Daly's, and, and, and I'm sure, you know, back to summer, I'm sure you were scratching in your head a little bit, Brian, with, you know, Tam, you probably didn't know Tam and, and what that appointment looked like, but I'm sure, you know, hearing this today and watching the journey that they've been on for the last three or four months, Gives you a sense of pride for your club too, Brian. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I would say one thing: I wasn't scratching my head, you know. <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was a, you know, and and I think that's that t- round about the time. I think I came off social media. I'm like, I'm I, sick of I remember talking to you about shit, it. You know? I remember talking I, to you about it. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't scratching my head. You know, yeah. I, I thought the the promoting from within. Um, and let's see how it let's see how it goes, you know. I mean, why yeah. not? You know, why yeah. do we keep going back to like ex yeah. players and stuff like that? So yeah. I think it's I think it's great that that Tam's doing well. I think it's great that the club's doing well. I've had my shot at management. I know how difficult it is. It's yeah. it's a lonely place at times, you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'm 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 delighted for Tam. I'm delighted for the club. You know, and hopefully things can can keep moving forward. You know. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks for joining us, Brian. Feel free to go get your shopping trolley and get the groceries. Uh, no bother. Cheers. Hey, uh, catch it up. Thanks, pal. And, hey, and pal. just to just to jump back on here, Tam. Um, you know, I I think just hearing that you know that journey that you've been on is is fascinating for everybody on this call. And you know, everybody on this call is is you know, predominantly North America based, full time in the game at very different levels. We've got club directors, we've got club technical directors, we've got college and university coaches, women's coaches, men's coaches, everything you can imagine. But I think we can all relate to this. We can, we all can. 
you know, in this journey, and we've all got a different story, and we've all been on a different pathway, but so much of this relates to all of our journeys also. Yeah, and it's, it's why I was really keen to do it as well, because I, th I think w w when I left Kelty, and the reason I, I decided to leave Kelty at the time is because them getting into League Two, where, where they're at at this moment in time, is not really where, where I wanted to be. It was the right time to, to, to jump off the journey at that point in time. And if the truth be told, Eric, if, if you were probably part of my network at that time, I probably would have reached out to you to actually say, look, I'm an aspiring coach. I'm looking for a different challenge. I don't see anything because nobody was nobody was actually banging my door in Scotland to say, you know, you've done a great job at Kelty. We'd, we'd like to give you this opportunity. Um, that just wasn't materialising. And Andy Goldie was brave enough to give me the opportunity in the United's Academy, which I'll be forever grateful for. And then Tony Ashgar obviously made an, an even braver decision to, to appoint a relative nobody into the head coach position, which obviously brought a lot of heat onto, onto him. And I probably went another stage further because I appointed Tony Sun into my, my management team. Yeah. And that, that that was something that was even even within the club, you know, from the, the board of directors, yeah. they were yeah. they were questioning whether or not that was the, the, the right decision. And I, I remember having a call with the with the owner to say categorically, you know, I, I want Adam to be part of the staff. I've known Adam five or six years, I've known Tony 18 months, two years, and this is the right thing to do. Tony's actually put his neck on the line for me. I'm putting my neck on the line for Adam. And that was probably the start of me showing that I wanted to be really decisive. And if you're going to appoint me, then we're going to do things properly here. And I want supported with who I want on my staff. And I think to that point as well, Tam, as I look at the dynamic between you and Foxy and Adam, and, and you know, that's your that's your your kind of inner sanctum. And and that's your that's your uh, you know, as I would call it, your technical heart there. And you look at that journey and, and you know, as you just described, Adam's come from a different, you know, Adam's a former player, went through the, you know, Motherwell Youth System and all that stuff and, and then went to Annan and a couple other clubs. You know, Foxy's a very, very well-respected guy within the game in Scotland. And you look at all three of your journeys and and and, and it's very different. Mm -hmm. And and look at where you are today, you know, at Ibrox and Celtic Park, you know, taking on the country's best and, and you know, and, and and you're absolutely putting your best foot forward. And, and it's weird, and I think just what I was touching on earlier, Adam and I often joke because we, we met each other on the B licence. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than Adam, but I'm still a relatively young coach. So from the, the B licence and the A licence, you know, we, we've actually developed a lot of really good, strong relationships with coaches working at different, you know, facets of the game. But Adam and I would get together regularly, talk football, challenge each other's ideas, both of us were actually scared to actually go up to the coffee machine and actually tap our card because we actually had no money. You know, yeah, we were yeah. like, I, I'd actually given up full time work to go and be the county manager. Adam was, you know, doing some stuff with the performance school. He was, you know, doing some work with Motherwell. And what we, it, it felt like we're a million miles away from, you know, yeah. being accepted here and actually getting the opportunities that we felt we were capable of delivering on. But again, and, and see just on the next slide. Yeah. Because what, what I've said, uh, th th this has been a really good kind of reflection piece for me. When I kind of look at all the sacrifices I've made and probably some of the very stupid, impulsive decisions I've made to, to have a career in football, I, th I thought to myself, I wouldn't do it all again. If somebody said you had to do all this again, would you do it? I wouldn't. But then I, I seen something online, you know, yesterday, that, that actually made real sense to me. And, and I, I don't know if, if somebody on this call needs to hear this as well in terms of their journey, but if I look at my coaching journey started at 32, I got the Dundee United job at 39, and it feels like there's been so many turbulent days trying to you know get, get a, a foot on the ladder, so to speak. But when I kind of look in over the space of like seven years, I am quite proud of you know, the journey that I've been on, the strides that I've taken, the gambles that I've taken, the support that I've had for family and friends and those in my network. And it does actually feel worth it. So I'm really grateful whoever tweeted this a couple of days ago because I, I really needed to hear that at the time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and 
you know, moving on next slide here, Tam, and, and certainly I do want to open up for Q&A at the end. Another, you know, as I think about, you know, your culture and, and, and building out a culture and driving a vision and a strategy, I also think about, you know, the, the, the senior players who are not in the equation and how you manage that. That's a challenge for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. who are not in that starting 11 on a Saturday, who are, you know, maybe wanting to speak to you on a Monday morning because they're, they're not coming on the pitch or, you know, and it's senior players at a very high level, you know, give us an insight to some of that stuff because I feel as if that's such a key at the high performing level. Yeah, I think as a manager, if, if all you ever hold yourself to account on is a relationship that you've got with 11 players that you select each week, then I don't think you'll have longevity in the game. And it'll always be superficial relationships because players will be smart enough to realise that they can have a relationship with you when they're in the team. And then there'll be no depth to the relationship when they're not in the team. So I, I place a lot of importance on having individual relationships with players, regardless of whether or not they're, they're, they're performing in the team. And I think Mark Reynolds is probably a, a good example of that. Someone who is club team captain, almost ever present last year, played really well, strong performer in the Premier League. But through a change in formation, through the signing of Charlie Mulgrew, he's not played as much football as what he would have wanted. And we've actually had some really frank, on, on his behalf, very frustrating conversations as well, but they've always been open. They've always been man-to-man -man with a lot of eye contact and I've managed his expectations. And, and because I've done that, I've always felt like he's still totally got my back. I still use him for, for feedback and, and almost a, a, a comfort and shoulder at times. And I think the reason that we have that relationship is one example is because I haven't distanced myself from him because he isn't playing for us on a weekend. I actually value him with his experience, his leadership, his track record. And I want to glean as much from that relationship as possible so that in the future, we can look back and say, I maybe didn't pick you as often as you wanted, but at least there's an underlying respect between each other. And I think that's a lesson for all of us, Tam, is, is when you look at, you know, all of the people here who are technical directors, coaches, you know, college coaches, all that stuff is how do you manage that 12th man? Because that 12th man can be such an influence on the rest. You know, they can be toxic, they can be positive, they can be a cheerleader, they can be an asset. And 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 I think, you know, that there's a massive lesson in that one is how do you know, and you can take that into the corporate world as well. And 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 how do you manage that? Because that filters, you know, through the rest of the group. Mm -hmm. and, and I think as well, if we use Mark Reynolds again as, as, as an example, the rest of my players are, are looking at that relationship and what they're trying to understand is if I'm ever not in the team or my contract's not being renewed, is this a guy who is just going to wipe his hands off us and almost see us as, as used commodities or is he going to try and you know, exit us with respect? and care and consideration for the next part of our careers. Because if you look at the average managerial tenure, it, in certain leagues, it's, it's under a year. On average, it's maybe 18 months to two years. So I think to, to if I'm a manager that targets longevity, then the only way to have longevity in my mind is to have real strong, deep, meaningful relationships with your players. That doesn't mean to say that you're going to pick them. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to like each other on a regular basis. It just means that you're actually going to be respectful. You're going to be upfront and they're actually going to respect your job and the need to be decisive at key times as well. Yeah. Give us an insight, Tam, to, you know, I, I think two pieces to this question. You know, number one, about managing up, you know, obviously Tony's on the call here and, and we're going to be careful what we say about him. But, how, you know, you, you're you're your take on how you best manage up. You know, you look at Tony that sits above you, you look at the American owners, Mark and Scott, that, you know, sit above Tony and he reports into it. Give us your insight to, to how you manage up. You mm -hmm. know, and I, I think, again, all of us um, have that to deal with on a daily basis, you know, and I'm looking at, say, you know, the college coaches, they've got to manage up to their athletic director or their associate AD and people like that. Give us your insight to, to what's worked well for you and how you manage up as well, Tim. It's probably similar to, to what I ask the players. So anytime that they want to have a, a frank discussion with me, just 
understand and respect my job. That my, my job is to make decisions. I'll live and die by those decisions. And I'm very comfortable making those decisions, even if, if they're unpopular. So whenever I'm managing up the way, I always try and respect the, the, the pressures of that job, of the accountabilities of that job. And also the, the relationship that, that Tony and I have got in particular, Tony is quite happy to be vulnerable with me. He's, he's openly and honestly admitted where, where he wants to be better. I'm very vulnerable with him in terms of where I want to get better. And, and I think the more connection you can have in terms of, I, I have a almost a subliminal target to make Tony a better sporting director by maybe at times challenging him at the right time in the right way and um, not necessarily calling him out in front of other people because that that's not the best way to actually engender relationships. So we do challenge each other, but there's a lot of support there as well. And there, there's also a lot of acknowledgement that we're actually very early in both our journeys, our respective journeys. Yeah. Therefore, we're, we're going to make mistakes either with each other you know, we're, we're going to make mistakes that have an impact with players, with a club, but there'll always be honest mistakes. And as long as that we've got that underlying respect and recognition for each other's jobs, then we could always grow stronger from it. I think, you know, the, 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 to that piece, just as you talk about your synergy with Tony and managing up in the, in the role, one of the things has been brilliant for this year, and we'll get questions are starting to come in now as well. But one of the things I think, and I read one of the, the recent interviews in the Courier there is is about, I think the quote was laser-focused recruitment. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you look at your recruitment this year, um, it's been nothing but exceptional. You know, mm -hmm. you look at maybe some gambles or some of the, you know, the, some of the players that you've brought in, you know, the fitted, you know, the, the characteristics of the player and, you know, the, the fitted the playing style and the fitted the culture of the club and do you want to speak to that a little bit of the role that you play within that between you and Sean and Tony and, you know, and what that looks like, Tam? It's, it's one of the things that gave me real confidence when I came into this job, because when, when I looked at what we collectively achieved at Kelty, albeit with a, with a kind of part-time semi-professional club, I took a lot of confidence knowing that, well, if I've got better players to work with, if I've got a better medical staff, sports science now, physiotherapists, you know, you've got a dedicated recruitment team, a sporting director that can actually allow you to focus on, you know, coaching and management and leadership and development of the, the, the football side of the club, then that, that gave me a lot of confidence that, you know, I, I could have an impact here. And all we've done so far is had a good start. But with regards to recruitment, it was really interesting when I was first announced and naturally there was a lot of questions from the media assuming that as head coach or first team manager that I would know everything about recruitment or the, the contractual situations with players. But the reality is, is that I'm engaged at, at the appropriate time, whether that's contractual negotiations with existing players or when it's the the recruitment team and Tony want me to consider a shortlist of players because their job, whilst I'm coaching and thinking about the team and preparing for the week to week, they're actually thinking about the, the contractual situation with players. They're thinking about the squad model. They're thinking about a player who this time last week was a potential signing target, but for whatever reason isn't now. And I've not got emotionally involved in that because I don't, I can't, I can't invest time in things that aren't concrete. So having a, a dedicated recruitment team with the network that, that we've got, with the access to data that we've got, and also the fact that we're highly aligned in terms of what it is we're trying to be from a playing perspective, what each position needs to be able to do in order to give us healthy competition, and what's attractive to us from a, from a character and a mentality perspective, I think we've actually managed to, to nail that pretty quickly and to know that we've actually got, you know, a dedicated team working on our behalf as a coaching staff whilst we're on the training pitch, it gives us a lot of confidence that we can attract the right players. Sounds brilliant. Rico, how are you doing today? And the first question up, Rico. I'm good, mate. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for jumping in, as always, mate. No, no Go on. problem. Uh, Tam, Tam, really insightful. Um... I think, I think also inspirational in terms of the way you're talking about everybody's journeys being different and stuff. I'm kind of one mm -hmm. of those ones. I actually worked with Adam um, and Andy in the performance school at Braithurst for a little bit. 
yeah. um, before kind of coming back out to the States. And again, the lack of opportunities probably back home is one one mm-hmm. of the things that kind of that affected my journey. But I just wondering, what's your own personal aspirations for the next kind of five, 10 years? Like, do you have a strategic plan or are you very much kind of like taking it as it comes uh, and, and kind of taking opportunities as they arise type thing? Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting you say that, and I'm I'm actually pleased that you're actually the first person to acknowledge that because when I came onto this call, I actually anticipated that if I was sitting in the room, I would imagine that there's been a lot of people that have probably done a lot of really good work in Scotland, but there's a real bottleneck for opportunities here, isn't there? It's so difficult to actually, you know, get a, an appropriate level of opportunity. So I'm glad that that's kind of resonated with you a little bit, and you've actually had the the, the chance to work with with Andy and Adam. Um, Can be careful here, though. His mother will die hard, absolute <laughs> die hard. So he, he might throw a curveball in a minute. To be fair, they're flying just now. Eh? They're doing really well. Um, uh, I, I picked up, I picked up uh, Robbie's tactics for the other week. So I'm passing them on to Graham Alexander. So hopefully, that was all his thoughts. <laughs> I purposely stayed away from that type of stuff today, just in case. <laughs> um, so, so the question was that around aspirations. I just like your own, like, do you have a, a 510 strategic plan for yourself, um, whether that's within the club or out, out with the club, just in terms of your own personal development? It's really weird because, see, if you had have asked me that at Kelty, I, I probably would have said, look, I, I want to be a, a Scottish Premiership manager. I, I feel like I, I, I could operate at that level. I feel like I've invested enough. I feel like I've actually, you know, done a lot of the, the hard miles required to, to get a crack at that level, at least at the least championship. And, and, and a full-time role, I, I would have backed myself at that point. I think probably where I am just now, mate, is I'm now at, at that point where we, we've had a good start, but I, I don't know if we can sustain it. So we, we could be talking in six months' time and I'm, I'm back managing at Kelty. You know, it's I'm almost at that really awkward point where, look, I, I think I'm a premiership manager. We, we've had a good start and we're, we're getting good feedback for the players. We're getting good you know, feedback, you know, from external parties. But I'm massively ambitious, but I also have a lot of respect for the opportunity that I've been given here. I mean, there's been one man in Scottish football, well, two guys, including Andy, Andy and Tony, that have actually put their balls on the line for me. So I'm obviously going to have to show a lot of loyalty back to, to those guys, to this football club. But I've also got a relationship with these guys who are both ambitious in their own right. And we, we talk about the future regularly. And I think sometimes, I, I don't know the environments that, that you work in, but I think it's healthy to talk about what the future might hold. And, you know, if, if you were to exit somewhere having been really successful, then sometimes it's better just to talk about it. If, if Tony was speaking to a future manager to replace me through good, bad or indifferent performance, then I would see that as being a smart sporting director so that it doesn't have to be reactive if anything untoward were to happen. So to answer your question, I'd love to challenge myself and say I could be a top-level manager. That That's what I feel like I'm dedicating and giving myself to every single day in, in this job and e- even previously. But I'm also respectful that we've only had a good start and I don't want to get ahead of myself. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Next question we have from Ewan. Ewan, you have a question. Do you want to put yourself on video, Ewan? Perfect. Yeah, thanks for your stuff this afternoon, Tom. Really interested. My question yeah. is, how did you change from that sort of part-time structure at Kelly, which I assume was sort of Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, to the full-time challenges of being in every, every day and having those extra staff to, to manage? It's a really good question, and it's see see in terms of actually going into the the academy set, and that that was probably a really nice kind of middle ground for me, because I think see, see when I I think back to to Rico's question to go from Kelty to Dundee United part time to full time, the, the jump probably would have been too big in terms of understanding sports science loading you know, distances, dimensions, you, you, you know what it's like, you know, in, in terms of even probably the, the coaching that you guys are doing. So going into the academy first was a really nice kind of gentle introduction to the full-time environment because I've probably delivered more sessions at Dundee United within a year than I did doing my whole time at Kelty because we were two nights a week. And also when you're working with part-time players, you've got to keep them at the pub. You've got to, you know, you 
you, you've got to make sure you're one step ahead of them. Oh, you know, my, my flight doesn't get back in from Germany until Thursday at half. No, it doesn't. I, I checked it. It comes in at nine o'clock this morning. I will see you tonight. You know, oh, I'm working a double shift. No, I, I drove past your house. I seen your car there. I will see you at training tonight. So there's a lot of interesting things that at, at, at part time, there's a real honesty to the players. You know, the they play for enjoyment. They play for, you know, competition. Whereas this is a guy's careers. So they obviously want to get better. But naturally, when you're dealing with sports science and you're dealing with, experts in, in, in different areas of the football club, everyone's got an opinion. So it's trying to kind of balance off what we want and need from a performance perspective to prepare for the week and also to protect all the other experts in the club. And that can sometimes be a bit of a challenge because as you can imagine, there's a lot of people with a lot of expertise and that, that brings opinions. And I've got to make sure that I do what's right for the rest of the staff, but also get performances and results at the weekend. Oh man, thank you, Sam. Brilliant, thanks you. And I don't know if I've got any. Have you got any other slides that you want to run on to, Sam? And and I'm I'm certainly being aware of your time. I know you you know time restrictions and all that stuff. But certainly, we'd love to see you know the the, the last little the last little segment here, Sam. I think what I'm what I'm kind of prepared to show, if I could actually, I'll stop sharing. So I'll stop sharing, and I'll I'll start sharing again. Yep. Um, can you see that Excel spreadsheet now? Yep. Yep. Can yeah. see that. So just, just to go through a couple of things, I, I, I believe that performance can be designed, not, not, not 100%, but I think you can design performance by being as intentional as, you know, individual conversations, where you want to get points from, how you, how you control an internal and an external narrative, which obviously in my case was, was really important because the external narrative could have, it, it could have actually put me under if I allowed it to. So every single season, and I, and I started to develop this at Kelty, and I've showed people this type of stuff before, and they, they think it's maybe a little bit too heavy, and I'm thinking, well, this is what we were doing at Kelty, and this is why we had success. So if I could bring your attention to, to, to this box here, what I like to do at the start of a season is to tier a league, and it's just simply by going on transfer market, and the average attendance of the club, the, their home attendance, and the market value of their squad, combine that and what it allows you to do is actually to tier the league. So at this moment in time, you can see that, look, Celtic and Rangers, true to form, tier one clubs. At the time, Hearts were, a, they're probably a tier two club, to be fair, but they're tier three because they just came out of the championship. So I, I like to keep an eye on who's performing well in the league. So Celtic, Rangers, they're being competitive. This is a super competitive league. Nobody's really massively, like Ross County are a tier four team. They're sitting bottom, but they're actually performing well just now. Their results are probably not befitting of their performances. So when I'm speaking to the press, I can be very explicit on the fact that I know that this is a low margin for error league. Anyone can beat anyone. And it helps me kind of calibrate my own, even on the back of, you know, two defeats recently, I'm relaxed because I know that this is a super competitive league that anyone can be anyone on their day. And in, and in here, what I like to do is I just like to be quite explicit about where we're targeting our points from. So what, what I've said is that if we can get three points from Celtic this year, three points from Rangers, then, and all the way down. So this, sorry, this is the remaining points because we've already actually taken points from these teams. Our target is to get 48 points this year as, as a minimum because what that kind of tells you is that historically 44, 51, 52, 46 and 45 points will be enough to get you between 5th and 8th. But we'd obviously target in the top 6. So as a, as a minimum, we need to get between 40 and 50 points. So I'm pretty certain that 48 points will be enough to get us as a minimum in at the top six. And already we're on 21. So 21 in the first quarter. And if we can get 16 points each quarter between now and quarter four, then that would give us a high probability of getting into the, into the top six. So again, when you've suffered back-to-back -back defeats like we have just now, we can say to the players, lads, just remind, we've got 21 points in the first quarter. We're plus five in the first quarter. We can give away 17 points 
any quarter and still make the top six. So to get beat against Hearts at Tynecastle, there's no shame in that. And our our target per per game is 1.45 points per game. And at this moment in time, we're actually tracking on 1.61. So again, no need to panic. We're bang on track. We're actually above performance just now. So naturally, that just gives the players a little bit of confidence that we know what we're doing. We know what we're tracking towards. We're not limiting our thinking that 16 points is all we're targeting. It's just giving us a reference point that even if we do suffer a couple of defeats, there's no need to panic. And as you can see from this graph here, we've had a, a really solid start to the season. There, there's a, a, a lot of back-to-back -back victories and our average league position so far has, has been fifth and we're currently sitting in fourth. So when I first got the job here, I was I was very um, opinionated on the fact that I believed in the squad. I didn't think that we needed a, a lot of recruitment. And th th this is a tab that I've actually got populated elsewhere, but for, for the benefit of you know discretion towards the players. So what I like to be able to do to inform relationships is, where is each player from a... From a performance perspective, Benji Segrist is a key player for us. I would probably say that, that Trevor Carson is extremely valuable. And I would also say that Jack Newman is a Scotland under-19 goalkeeper, is an emerging talent, cultural. Benji, absolute architect, architect. And Jack is someone who sits in the middle. Sorry, Jack is someone who sits in the middle um, because he's only 19. Um, just update that. So what that tells you, even if we just look at the goalkeeping function, is that we've actually got some really kind of strong players. Benji is currently captain. He's a leader. I would say that Jack is just an operator as a, as a young guy. And also Trevor is probably a, a, an operator. Could they make match-winning saves? Yes. Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. And then from there, as a coaching staff, we, we just score this. So at least then we've got a benchmark for each player. And typically what you find is that the player with the highest score is the one that's best in each position. So they're the guys that typically play each week. But what it does from a coaching perspective is that it helps us understand where the skills gaps are. So when we're designing group practices, unit practices, individual practices, we're putting clips together, we're looking for role model players, all of this is actually informed from the data. So as soon as we benchmark this, this actually then informs recruitment. So if we're looking to replace a goalkeeper, we would go through the same process by scoring them because we only want to recruit players who are going to improve what we've actually already got. And again, it's it's a way of actually validating gut, gut feel and also what our eyes tell us. Maybe something that will interest a, a few guys on the call, um, and this is kind of linked to when I'm dealing with the board and I'm speaking to Tony, a KPI for, for my development in this role is the development of young players. So I've, I've created a model which is just really simply, you know, low, medium, high potential, low, medium, high performance. And I've just created some language around each box and what I'm targeting myself is developing young players through these boxes. So at this moment in time, for, for anybody that knows Dundee United, our two most saleable assets are Benji Segrist and Jean Fuchs. And at this moment in time, they're the highest performing assets. They're performing optimally and they're operating at the top of their capabilities. So they don't actually have a lot of growth potential at this club because they're, they're performing at top capabilities. That doesn't mean to say that we couldn't keep them, that we couldn't develop them further. But in terms of where we are as a team right now and where they are, they're performing at an optimal level. So our board of directors know that if we get appropriate interest at the appropriate valuation, then these are two guys that naturally are going to attract interest. Doesn't mean to say that we naturally want to sell them. The next group underneath that are the ones that we're hoping to elevate into the top box. So Ian Harks, 16-year-old Kerr Smith, who we played away at Celtic Park, who we played in the Dundee Derby. These are the guys who we feel are ripening towards being sellable assets. Again, we're in no great rush to sell these players, but 
they could be players that, that will have a market value. And this is where it starts to get really exciting for, for, for us because this group of players here are the ones that we're actually given exposure to the, the live environment, training with us every day, access to the video, getting access to the views, being pushed, being you know involved in individual practice, group practice. And what you can see in this outside uh, box here is that these guys have growth potential, as do these guys. So we want to create a, a coaching environment every single day where, yeah, we're working towards the week-to-week the, the -week performances, results, but contained within that, we need to facilitate the development of so many players here. And that that's a, that's a huge way of expectation and, and a real burden because we actually carry the weight of so many young players in their journeys that we want all these guys to succeed wherever possible. So being very intentional about how, when and where we develop young players, how we give them opportunity, what gives us confidence that a 16 year old Kerr Smith is going to be able to mark, you know, the Celtic strikers out the game and, and be part of a team that can get a one all draw at Parkhead. So everything that, that we are doing is very, very intentional and linked to what I call performance design. And, and again, something that we spoke about, Eric, as well, is the, the reliance on your senior players. And, and, and I like to call them enablers. So these are the guys that we have honest, frank discussion with. They might play 150, 200, 300 games for the club. They might sign for six, seven, eight years on, on a continuous basis. But these are the guys that will be the cornerstone of the club and they get a different type of service to our most sellable assets to the young players that we're developing and we're really trying to individualize the the, the program here and i think the big thing for me as well tom listening to some of this is uh, living in my corporate world I, I do a lot of nine boxes you know and, and it's brilliant to see you take the the, the nine box you know project and implement that in your high performance plan and strategy because mm -hmm. it's, it's such a, you know, comes from the HR world, but it's so simple to put into this context. And and you've got the data then to back up your gut and your conversations. 100%. And well, one of the things that I've kind of come to realise, and e e even today on, on this call, every single human interaction gives us a feeling in our stomach about someone. And I think when you're a football manager and a staff, We'll all have biases, and you're probably aware of the halo and the horns effect as well. So, you know, the hardworking player, the conscientious player, you always have, you know, the halo above their head. But equally, the guy with the horns who's maybe five minutes late every now and again, you know, comes from a different country. I always just like to get beneath the person and actually look at ways to adapt and to connect. So, so the more information that I can have on players, and I've never, ever, ever in my whole managerial career sat down with a player and showed them this. I don't even show this to a lot of people because it can sometimes feel a little bit too heavy, a little bit too, a little bit too much for people. But see, when you actually place such a strong emphasis on developing players, wanting players to actually have a top career in the game, then I think we're actually obligated as a staff to give them as much service through as much detail as humanly possible. Any questions on that? You know, and, and I'm watching body language here and, and some people are, you know, fascinated by it. And, and I think it's such a, you know, the content here is is, is priceless. Um, if anybody's got any questions, feel free to fire away. Or if you want to show any more, Tam, um, certainly just people probably, are lapping this up. Just, just one last thing. Um, and, and, and this is again about thinking about the room and thinking about, you know, kind of where my journey was. I think one of the key things I was nervous about, about coming into this level is that maybe I'd be standing on the touchline and a manager would make a tactical alteration and I, I wouldn't know what to do. So I've, I've placed a lot of emphasis on documenting, on reverse engineering a game through hours upon hours upon hours of video analysis in my own time to prepare for each opponent. And I've got a simple framework that, that I've got that if, and, and I, I carry this in a book on the touchline as well. So if, if I know that a team goes, you know, 4-1-4-1 four, one, four, one, when they're winning 2-1 or when they do something when they're winning 3-0 or losing 3-0, I always like to have a tactical alteration up my sleeve so I'm not saying that we make wholesale changes, but what I know is that against a 4-1-4-1, one, one, 
you only need a plus a plus one to build. Then if you create a box around the, the middle of the 4141, then you can create an overload and you can pin their pack four with, with, with two strikers. So I've always got in my head what a team might do, what the analysis tells me that they've done historically, and also what's within the realms of our capability to adapt within a game as well. So that this, this diagnostic, and I, I can click on and hide just now and you'll see another 30 or 40 tabs. I've really invested a lot in documenting over my, my leadership and management career so that every single thing that we do, conversations, text messages, decisions that we take, nothing happens by chance or very little happens by chance. Brilliant. Any other questions on this, guys? Tell me, I, 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 this is fascinating just to get an insight to, to some of this. Um, Chris, Chris Steves, you've got a question there. Do you want to just, just stick yourself on a video, Chris? Yes, no problem. Uh, well, so far, this has been fantastic. My question is, if you've got a targeted player, just looking at your last couple of slides, that has done really well through the academy, but is getting to that, point where you're thinking about including him, mm -hmm. but he's not quite fitting, going back to the square pegs round holes, do you change a, a plan for the player, or do you add, do you kind of try and force him to get in line with what you're looking for, or do you just, at what point do you make a decision to say, this kid's not really going to fit, or we can make him fit, if that makes any sense? No, it, it completely does. And I think even just to add a little bit of a, a caveat to that question, when I came into the job, Chris, one of the things that I asked the club not to do was to make um, any sign-ins in the attacking areas because I actually had a lot of confidence that who we have coming through from the academy and, and the pathway in the wide areas and the number 10 type positions that these guys could get opportunity, whether it be from the bench, whether it be starting. I really do believe that, you know, with a little bit of time, a little bit of patience, that we could actually unearth some, some really talented young players. So again, the, the first thing that I wanted to do was actually not block their pathway, to actually give them the opportunity of training with us each day, because all, all young players have got IPPs here, individual performance plans. So... What, what they want to be in control of over the next predetermined amount of time. Now, what, what I've got in my favour here is, and I know I know the, the pre-academy, maybe not as much in pre-academy now because I'm a little bit detached as a first-team head coach, but I know all the players in the academy. I've, I've coached the majority of them. They know me by name. And one of the things that I'd like to think that I am with young players is really patient, patient to their imperfections, patient to their flaws, but what I do need to see every single day is an appetite and a mentality. I, I need to see a character. I like, I like to feel that they can articulate who they are as a player. Who, who are you at your best? When, when you get an opportunity for Dundee United's first team, what, what is it that you will reflect on and say, I was really proud of my performance today because Chris Mockery is a Scotland under-19 internationalist. We gave him an opportunity against Hearts in a fairly unfamiliar position, and it wasn't his best game. And he actually gave the ball away, and Hearts scored their second goal. Kerr Smith um, had a, a family bereavement a fortnight ago, and he came off the bench at Tynecastle and he sold one of the goals. And he, even as a as a manager who's still at this moment in time probably not wholly accepted for being you know at the level. I, I do think I've got a level of acceptance now to actually have the balls to actually play a 16 year old against Celtic and, and against, you know, Hearts and still be able to come out in the press afterwards and, you know, avoid the, the uncomfortable questions about, you know, the, how will you deal with Kerr Smith after the mistake today? I really don't dwell on young players making mistakes because the key thing for me is that if, if I feel their mentality, I feel if their character's in place, I feel like the dressing room accepts them, then naturally young players, when they get opportunity, they are going to make mistakes. They're going to contribute to us losing points. And my job is to try and make sure that I, through all the data that I've got available to me, that if we play Kerr Smith at Celtic, we have a lot of confidence that he's ready to play. 
And then equally, the next the game week, say it's against a Motherwell who are a bit more direct and a bit more physical, we won't play them in that game. So we have a lot of information on young players through their, their, their individual performance plans. We spend a lot of time getting to know them and we also manufacture some challenges for them. And I, I won't mention the young player's name, but when I took over the job, I think maybe some of the young players thought, well, that's me, I've made it. The, the club's actually appointed someone within the academy. All the academy players are going to get the first opportunities. And one of our highest kind of value young assets, I actually sent to train with under 18s for, for two to three weeks. Because for me, it looked like he was taking advantage of the, the environment. He was taking advantage of the fact that he's a professional. And I think that sent a really early warning signal that I will give young players opportunity. But if you don't take this seriously, you don't respect the environment, you don't respect the club that you're actually playing for, then you're not going to be compatible with me. So I'd like to think I set my stall out early, Chris. Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, Tam, I'll tell you what, <laughs> we're 90 minutes in here and our plan was to be 60. So uh, I think we'll just wrap this up here unless we have any other questions. That was fascinating. Absolutely brilliant. Can't thank you enough. The fact that you went and got a haircut right. as well just says, you know, says mountains for you, Tam. Um, but, you know, a big thanks to Tony for, you know, for, for his involvement in setting this up too. And I think this was, I'm sure everybody will agree, it was just, you know, brilliant to get an insight to your journey and, um, you know, just to watch where you've been and where you're going, Tam. And you want to, and you want to finish up with, Tam? No, just uh, probably again an olive branch for the future. Um, if if anybody wants to to get in touch, my, my response times just with the job I'm doing just now it might not be like an instant response. But if if there's anything that anybody wants to ask or or I don't know, even just kind of share, I'm I'm more than happy to stay connected because this that this type of group is probably where I feel really comfortable because. I know what it's like to actually coach in Scotland, to seek aspiration in Scotland and how difficult it is. So if anybody needs anything from me in the future, then I'll, I'll be happy to oblige. Brilliant. Big thanks from us. I know Tony's still here. Tony, do you want to step in and finish off the Tenerife story? I think you might still be here. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that Tenerife story. Feel free to jump in, Tony. No, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity, Eric and, and Tam, well spoken. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all at the convention in, in January. Great point. Um, thanks, Tony, and the, Tony and the club owner, thanks, Tony. Um, four of the staff from Dundee United, they'll actually be presenting at the convention and they'll also be presenting at the Scottish Coaches Association um, meeting at the convention. So they'll be our... Um, Mark Ogren and Tony will be our keynote speakers at the Scottish session on the Friday afternoon in Kansas City. Um, but they're also doing a lecture on the, I think it's the Friday or the Saturday morning in Kansas City as well. So we'll see, you'll certainly see more of Tony and and all the, the executive staff there. But huge thank you, Tam. Um, massive thanks. Best of luck to you this weekend. I know it's a big game for you getting back on track of the, the international break, but um, unbelievable. And, and just huge thanks for all your time. Thank you, guys. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.